please be seated. Welcome to our meeting uh, here, Revival Centres Church in Melbourne. Uh, welcome to those here, welcome to those listening uh, over the internet and it's really good to be gathered together. I'm going to be talking today about receiving the Holy Spirit and uh, I spoke a few weeks ago about baptism and at that time I talked about baptism and I reminded people that baptism was uh, itself a form of a burial service in that we were burying our old life with an expectation of rising again to new life. And we've just been singing that hymn there and the thought there that Christ is risen and uh, you know, because of that it brings hope, it stirs our soul and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course Christ is risen, the Bible tells us that he is the first fruits of those that rose from the dead and uh, meaning that he was the first of many that were to come and we have our moment when we receive the Holy Spirit where we start to partake in eternal life and uh, yes uh, people filled with the Holy Spirit still die and uh, that's our, our natural uh, way things are uh, but there is a future to look forward to and God has has through his son described to us and shown us uh, that in fact that there's more to life than just this natural life and if you think of all the things that uh, we concern ourselves with in life often it's a mad scramble to sort of you know experience it all before we're gone and uh, you know before we we rest in the grave or, or whatever kind of um, a phraseology people like to put around that um, you know going to sleep and so on all these things are more meaningful when you understand there is a resurrection and that there's something yet to come and we get a foretaste of that the bible tells us that we don't we, we see through a glass darkly we, we, we don't see how things are particularly uh, into the future and and how could we uh, but the bible tells us that we have an inkling of goodness to come through the infilling of the holy spirit so that's what I'm going to talk to you today. You can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14, if you will, please. Um, and uh, I'm going to start just with a, with a story. It's a story of a 14-year-old boy. And uh, this boy, uh, you know, really didn't have much understanding of the things of God. Uh, it's me. Just, you know, I was 14. Okay. And uh, didn't really have much understanding of the things of God. Was brought along to some meetings in a revival centre and uh, and found you know interesting uh, for the first time ever really uh, came across people who spoke about God as if he was really there rather than just being a concept or a good way to live your life you know all, all good in themselves I suppose but these people spoke of a God uh, whom they knew personally and that was quite new to me it really was and, uh, and and I listened to people giving testimony now we heard two people today uh, stand up and talk about uh, God answering them definitely and purposefully in their own lives and uh, I had never heard people speak like that before and of course I've heard it many times since and, and uh, you know when I was 14 was a long time ago as it turns out and I know I have heard many 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 people stand up and give testimony to the fact that they had a real and personal experience with God but up until that moment when I was 14 I'd heard a few and certainly nothing had happened to me and so I started uh, uh, you know, going along to this uh, church because my parents were there at uh, this, re this revival center my parents got filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, they had a personal direct experience with God and they spoke to me about that that was very unusual um, you know they both changed that was unexpected and uh, look after some time I found myself in a prayer meeting and I was in the prayer meeting, I was you know, on my knees as, as we did and um, uh, the pastor came and prayed with me and um, I, had, I had a moment, I had a definite and real experience. I got filled with the Holy Ghost and that wasn't, that's not just not me, you know, re sort of jigging backwards in time and saying that must, must have been what happened. I knew at that instant that something had happened. Uh, I began to speak in other tongues now, now that's an odd turn of phrase isn't it to speak in other tongues that's uh, you know the phrase itself probably comes out of our translation uh, a more meaningful way would be to simply say I began to speak in a language that I had not learned and didn't understand and you might think why on earth would you want to do that um, well it wasn't really a question of what I wanted to do this was God confirming his word to me directly 
and I was having an experience. And in that experience, uh, people have different experiences. Um, everyone who gets filled with the Holy Spirit speaks in other tongues. That's, that's what we preach here from the Bible. We're going to look at that in a moment. Uh, but I, I also had an experience of the love of God, uh, as it turns out, and it was uh, very real. I also had, and this is very probably important for me and my terribly intellectual frame of mind, I also had really revelation, and it was this, this is true. This is true because it's happening to me, and it's not being uh, mediated by some other person. I haven't been talked into something. I, I, I'm not, I haven't been slapped into a lather or something like that. I was simply uh, on my knees, quite simply, and, and I had this experience and I spoke with other tongues and I started going to the church and other people would come along and they would have the same experience and after a while I, 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 uh, I ended up uh, being a young people's leader and a house leader and things like that which are just sort of offices uh, you know in the church where perhaps you're helping some other people and um, and uh, then I, I became a pastor and, and uh, you know I went out to uh, Shepherd and I went to other places and um, you know, in, in those experiences, I had the opportunity, which I know everyone, not everyone does have, but most of us might. I had the opportunity of praying with someone as they received the Holy Spirit and seeing the look on their face when before it was not so sure and now it was real. And, and, and the, uh, well, shock often on people, shock and joy, but shock on people's faces that, Really, something had actually happened. We're so used to being disappointed in a religious sense. The religious uh, world partic uh, particularly doesn't really uh, put forward a personal experience. Oh, well, that, well, 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 they do, but it's sort of you know, quiet and within and it's a warm feeling. Whereas this was a genuine, unmistakable experience. In fact, it was so unmistakable that not only was it happening to the person to whom it was happening, but others that were nearby could see that person has, has just had a wonderful experience. And uh, for those of us in the know, so to speak, that person has been filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, for I hear them speak with other tongues. And so you, you see that something real is going on. Very, very different to the religious uh, experience. And uh, so I had this opportunity many, many times. And I've probably said this before, but it, it's the best I've ever come up with. You can go onto the internet now and you can find uh, people who hear for the first time because they get those cochlear implants. And you see someone with their face just you know, a, bit of a bit of a mask, you know, you, you know, I wonder what's... And then all of a sudden you hear, and sometimes it's a child, uh, they hear. And you see this. It, it's just incredible because this whole new sense has opened up to them that they couldn't even imagine what it was like before. There's, some, uh, there's another thing going around at the moment with um, uh, chromatic correction glasses. You should look these up, they're, they're, they're quite encouraging. Um, w which help people with certain kinds of colour blindness, doesn't help everybody, uh, and they put them on. And you, you see exactly this. Uh, I saw one of a, of a grandfather. His grandchildren had got together and bought him these glasses and they've got film of him as he's opening up the packet and so on and he puts it on and then he takes it off and he puts it on and he takes it off and he starts crying and he said is this what you see all the time incredible because the, a whole new sense has opened up that literally if you don't have it you could not have imagined and when I've been with people as have been filled with the Holy Ghost that's what I see and that's you know of, of all the things it, it, it's, it's sometimes tough being a pastor, you, you know, the things happen, you have your moments and so on, but everything else just pales into insignificant to such a, insignificance to such a moment. When you see someone have their world opened up to a broader spiritual reality that they could not have imagined, and that's what I was like. It was a moment in time, it was not, I didn't grow into this gradually, I didn't think I you know make an intellectual decision that I should you know be this kind of person because it seems a good thing to do it wasn't anything like that it was a moment in time an experience and it's called receiving the Holy Spirit let's, let's turn in our Bibles John chapter 14 Jesus speaking to his disciples he says in verse uh, 15 of John 14 verse 15 if you love me keep my commandments 
And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and shall be in you. And so he was Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he said, this, this is what's going to happen. He's preparing them for the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to come. He calls the Holy Spirit the Comforter, and he, and he says that he will abide with them forever. Uh, he, he calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth, whom the world can't receive, can't understand, can't comprehend, because it's completely outside of their experience. It's another dimension. It's, an, it's another sense, and, and, and they're just pale, weak uh, comparisons compared to the reality. But I bring them forth because, you know, people might uh, make a connection with them. You see, this, this is what it's like. And he said, um, he's going to abide with you forever. Uh, you know him, for he dwells with you, he said to the disciples. And so we, we've got this idea now that the disciples are walking around with Jesus on the earth. Uh, and every now and then they get a bit of an inspiration um, uh, here and there, Peter the Apostle and others say, uh, Peter the Disciple and others that say, you know, things that, that Jesus said, well, you've, you've really connected there. But he says, he shall be in you. And so Jesus is actually looking forward to a future time with his disciples. Let's go to Luke 24. just from verse 45 uh, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures that's pretty cool and he said unto them thus it is written and thus it behoves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day he's saying I'm going to die that's what he's that's what he's uh, telling them uh, and um, well actually he's, he's explaining what's already happened and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. He says, you, you know, you've, partake, you've seen this. And behold, he said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you, wait, in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And so he's telling them, there's more to come. He said, you've seen these things. You, you, you've seen me rise from the dead, uh, he's saying to them. And he said, I'm going to send the promise of the Father, which we just read about a little earlier. The Comforter will come. So let's turn uh, now to Acts chapter 1, which follows directly on from Luke, both written by Luke. And Acts, the, the word Acts means, Acts of the Apostles means, here's, here's things that happened in the church. This, this, this is how the church began, and here's some things that happened. That's how you could describe the heading, Acts. So Acts chapter 1. Uh, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, so Luke is writing to a fellow called Theophilus, uh, of all that Jesus both began both to do and to teach, and to the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after his death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. That's what we just read. Which said he, you have heard of me. For, and what, here's a bit more detail. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And so he's now making this connection between what John did. So what did John do? Well, John was a baptizer, and John undertook a, a somewhat mechanical-looking act. You know, uh, in one sense, anybody could do it, but done in the right frame of mind, it's completely different. Um, and he said that John was one who baptized with water. He said, but, but, and that was a foretaste and a forerunner, uh, and also symbolic, leading towards um, what Jesus is going to do. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost not many days hence and so he, this, this is the start of the church this is the very first thing uh, that's really being spoken about that Jesus came that he died that he rose again and he said wait for the promise of the father which we've just read here 
you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Oh, they did. They waited. It, it's a small point, but it's actually, a, it's a, let's spend a moment on it. They waited. They actually did as they were told. If they'd all wandered off some, uh, to other places and said, oh, did something happen in Jerusalem? Oh, Jesus told us to wait, but, you know, I was, I was busy. No, they, they actually, maybe it was difficult. Maybe they had to put themselves out. Maybe they felt themselves a little bit under pressure. Maybe they thought they might get into trouble. After all, it wasn't too uh, long ago that, that Jesus had been crucified. Yes, they'd seen him raised from the dead. I guess that gave them a little fillip to their... Um, uh, to their excitement about what might happen or what the promise of the Father might mean. Yes, Jesus had said, the Holy Spirit has been with you but shall be in you. But they didn't know either. They had not yet been filled with the Holy Ghost. But it's close. Anyway, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues uh, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And uh, they, were, they came together. Because, as I said earlier, when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a warm inner glow. I mean, it can be that, but that's not all it is. It's a definite experience. And this definite experience was seen by others. Not only was it seen by others, it was seen and heard. For they heard them, well, I should read on. The multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak uh, in his own language. And so there were, uh, amongst the, the, uh, all of the languages that were being spoken, uh, some of them were recognized by people um, uh, who were in Jerusalem for a feast. Uh, Feast of Pentecost, and uh, and that they were all there, and they were amazed, saying, "But hang on, these people are Galileans. How come they they're speaking? I can hear my language. What's going on?" Um, down in verse um, thirty-two. Oh, sorry, um, verse fourteen. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, hearken to my words, listen to me. He stood up and he said, listen to me. These are not drunken as, as, you, as you think, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young, young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And so he said, look, th this, this isn't just some weird religious shenanigans going on. This is the promise of the Father. And not only that, this was spoken about by the prophet Joel. And so, so you've got to think about these prophets, you know, from a, a long time earlier. And they're talking about these things and they're talking about the Spirit of God being poured out. And they wouldn't have known what it meant either. And the disciples and the others that were gathered, there's 120 people there uh, gathered together who were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They wouldn't have known what was going to come. But all of a sudden, the change has come. The, the Spirit of God has entered the equation the Spirit of God has joined with their spirit. They've been filled with, came into their own being. Like, it's very hard to explain these things because we're really talking about a connection between worlds. We've got our physical and nature and our human nature, which we understand very well, and you've got this whole spiritual world that we had no idea was there. And what you would have seen on all their faces, because I've seen it, was the moment of revelation. The Spirit of God is now with me in our church where our church is full of people in fact every member of our church is filled with the holy spirit in this way that we've just read this is how the church began and there's no real reason why the church should now operate on some other way other than some have left these things as not important or as optional or as you know having other meanings 
we read on in Acts chapter 2, because the people were, um, the crowd that gathered, it's fascinating that a crowd gathered. I've had the opportunity, I, talk about, I spoke about this when I spoke about baptism, of having a crowd gather when something was going on and having people having, se- people having seen someone filled with the Holy Spirit in front of their very eyes, peeling off their own clothes, you know, down to their, down to their good stuff, um, and wondering, if, what I mean by that, they're still dressed, um, and wandering into the water to be baptised, because they saw something happen. This is not the general religious experience. I'm not trying to be difficult or mean to people, but we should get this right. If this is foundational, if this is the thing that Jesus said to his disciples, you wait in Jerusalem until you have received the promise of the Father. And if we read here that the promise of the Father, that they waited, and that the promise of the Father was that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, and that that gathered a crowd of people who said, what's going on? And Peter's now going to stand up and preach to them, speak to them about what's going on. Isn't that important? In terms of timing, the book of Acts and the day of Pentecost is one of the most pivotal points in the Bible. Yes, there are other pivotal points. The fact that Jesus came. Jesus had to come that they might be filled with the Holy Ghost. The problem with God's uh, uh, you know, view of the world, I feel rude saying that, in God's view of the world, we're the ones with the problem, in God's view of the world, unrighteousness cannot dwell, live with righteousness. They cannot go together. And the only way to atone for unrighteousness the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. It's the only way through. And so there's actually no way. Because by the time that you're through and you've paid the price, it's too late. But Jesus came and he paid the price when it wasn't too late. And he died on our behalf. And because of that, that's why he came. That's why that's a pivotal moment. Uh, he came, he, he preached, he, he uh, died, he rose again. That was a pivotal moment. And all of this, he said, he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem because the promise of the Father's coming. You are going to be completely and utterly changed. All the things that you had difficulty with before, and it wasn't that long before, you look at the, the day that Jesus died on the cross, they all fled. Peter the Apostle, on the night that he was taken to be judged, was completely flabbergasted because a parlour maid not being rude to parlour maids but she wasn't you know a huge force in the society that's how it was a parlour maid said I think you were with Jesus and he carried on like a pork chop he swore and he carried on and said I don't know who he is this is the same Peter we're about to read about who's going to say something the change comes with the infilling of the Holy Ghost the change comes when the Spirit of God joins with your spirit everything else is religious And some of the religious stuff is nice and will give you a good life. And plenty of people sort of take that path. But it's not what God intended. God said, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem. The Spirit of God's going to enter into you. All right. So Peter stands up. This is verse 32. Peter, who had denied the Lord only a little while earlier, stands up and he says this. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Jesus has done this. Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit. Jesus has risen from the dead. Uh, he's in heaven wherever or whatever. That, you know, who, who can work those sorts of things out? Uh, you know, it, it's hard for us to understand spiritual concepts. The moment for us when we received the Holy Spirit was to recognize that there is a spiritual domain. But there's still lots of things that we don't understand. But Jesus is now sitting by the right hand of the Father and he is shedding forth this which you now see and hear. I was was christened when I was a a baby uh, in in the church that uh, that I was in. Uh, I didn't have much to say with it. The only reason I know it is because I've got a little cup with my name on it saying Jeffrey, you know, was, was christened. That, 
that's my only memory. I don't remember being there. Uh, I never made it to being confirmed in the church, but my, my wife was confirmed in the church that she was in. And the, the idea of con confirmation is this is the moment, uh, you know, under some churches' teaching that you receive the Holy Spirit. No crowd gathered. The only crowd that gathered were people who were invited, you know, who, who, who were going to um, uh, give the little boy or the little girl a hug afterwards because they were parents and grandparents and so on. No crowd gathered. And, um, you know, I said, what on earth is going on? But when the church started, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, a crowd gathered and they said, what's going on? Peter speaks here in verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. Definite. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said unto himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now these people are gathered, um, they were there because of the Feast of Pentecost and they were, uh, you know, I guess in one sense, uh, religious people. You know, they cared enough to come to this, uh, this feast. And so they knew what Peter was talking about uh, when he talked about someone being Lord and Christ. And in verse 37 we read this, When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This is the response when you realise that you've missed a whole aspect of life and you, it's suddenly been revealed to you that there's this whole new area of life. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, what are you going to do? That's the question they ask themselves. What, what, what should we do? Verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter didn't stand up and say, we're special. He didn't say, I'm special. What he said was, you too, to this crowd, who asked that question, what should we do? His answer was right back at them. This is for you too. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So he's now saying it's to you, to your children, and all those that are far off. Down, down time, uh, out into space, uh, I mean out, on, out into other parts of the world is what I mean by that. Um, down through time, this promise is to you. This is a pivotal verse. With many other words do you testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And so Peter now is pitching that you've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost and he's saying it's for you and for others and he's saying this is how you save yourself. This is how you are saved. This is the idea of salvation. This is the idea of being born again. This is the idea of being a new creation. When you come to the rest of the Bible, people have trouble with it. You, you, you can read the things that Jesus said at various times he said things and crowds left him in droves because they basically said, who, who can be like that? You know, how can anyone live up to what you're saying, Jesus? And they left him. And then we come to the New Testament, letters written to the church and they're full of advice and, 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 and an expectation that everybody in the church can live up to what God expects of them. Why is that? What's different? What's different is being filled with the Holy Spirit. It really is that foundational and that simple. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and I spoke a couple of weeks ago about walking in the Spirit and how important it was to just keep our focus on the things of God. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have what it takes. You are a new creation. All of the strange scriptures that talk about you having a pure mind, uh, that, that, that talk about you uh, being a powerhouse for the Lord, that talk about you going from victory to victory, from strength to strength. All those things that sound nice and you just think, oh, I just wish, all of a sudden are possible. And not only are possible, 
They are in fact what God intended. God intended that you be a new creation. He knew already that the old creation had had it. That's why his son had to come. He spent all, those, all that time back in the Old Testament where they sacrificed animals to show them that the result of sin, separation from God, is death. That was what all the animal sacrifice was about. Terrible time as you're an animal. Yeah, <laughs> just how it was. God showed uh, the people all that. And now we had this new creation. And so many in the world today, in a religious sense, are back in the Old Testament. They're trying to work hard. They're trying through their own strength to be good, whatever that might mean. It's too hard. God spent the whole of the Old Testament proving to them that they needed a saviour. And Jesus, when he came, said, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He walked around, he spoke of the Spirit to come, and he said, you wait in Jerusalem. And they waited in Jerusalem, and everything changed. That's our experience. That's what we're about. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because I haven't really gone to my talk that much. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I just want to spend a few moments here. Just in case I haven't been clear, I've tried to be clear. In case I haven't been clear, if you're not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a case of, oh, you ought to be, and, uh, and y you know, um, it's really important that you are, and so on. Uh, that, that's kind of, you know, transactional thinking. If you're not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, the message of Peter the Apostle to the crowd was, this is for you too. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can be. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit in this meeting today. You can take a bit longer to think about it. You can decide you want to be baptised today. We have a couple of baptisms coming up a bit later. Um, th these are all things that you could do. But don't just let it dribble away. Because the answer of God is, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Have this new dimension. It's bigger than the natural dimension. <laughs> Opened up to you. And know God in spirit and in truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's writing to the church here. I'm just going to read a few, a block of verses and then we'll make a couple of comments. So just from verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts or spiritual matters really, brethren I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. So you, you, you had a natural life, you, you, you thought about it, things in natural terms and you know you were swayed by one thought or another. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and, and that no man can say Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, and so now he's talking about gifts, but, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, and uh, you, can, you can read the, the context uh, here and, and around, uh, a bit of context coming as well. And he's, he's really saying to them, you've all got your part. But he's also saying to them, it's the Spirit of God that makes the difference. It's the Spirit of God, the same God which works all in all. Then he gives some examples. For one, for one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kind of tongues, uh, to another interpretation of tongues. These all work, that one, that, but all these work, that one and the self same Spirit, dividing and giving to every man severally as he will. So as needed, these, these things will arise uh, in your midst. Um, for the body is one, and has, as the body is one, has many members, and all the members of the one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. This is the verse I want to just dwell on for a moment. For by one Spirit are we all baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. And so what he's saying there is, the way you enter the body... Uh, which body? The body of Christ. So, so Jesus spoke about uh, his body um, and uh, he also spoke about the church, you know, as the body of Christ. And uh, that we're, we're Paul's really saying it here, and your members in particular, you know, you're in the body. But how do you get into the body? 
How do you get into the church? How do you join the church? Do you show up? Do you sign a card? Do you um, make a pledge? How do you join the church? We encourage people to be baptised. Well, you, you, I read it there in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptised and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is that how you join the church? Well, it's a good step, but what is the moment? And how does God say, this person is now in my church? And we read here there's differences of administrations and there's people here and there's all kinds of people we don't know about and, and never have. We think we're closer because of our information age and we can sort of check things out. Uh, but but in, in times past, you wouldn't have had a clue. And probably we don't have a clue today either, whether there's others here and there filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, but he said, um, verse 13, by one spirit are we all baptised into one body. So the way you join the church is receiving the Holy Spirit. That's how you join the church. You don't do that. You seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You seek to have God confirm your little kernel of faith towards him by saying, uh, I've heard many testimonies, Lord, I don't even know if you're really there, I'm not sure, show me. That's what some people have said. Uh, Lord, I, I do believe that you're there. I, I, I do believe there's a God and I've been shown that there's more. Is there more? God fills them with the Holy Spirit. The 14-year-old boy, me, on his knees, trying to nut everything out like I've done my entire life, having a moment of revelation that it's all true. This is how we enter the church. This is how we become a new creation. It's not a whole lot of religious mumbo-jumbo. It's receiving the Holy Spirit. It's actually as simple as that. All the people said.